Um, very nice to meet you all. I'm Toffee, so I'm the senior producer at Megaverse, um, and we're doing a interesting, strange project at the moment, um, which is being funded by UK Research Innovation. Um, they're calling it climate playmakers. We try to retire the house, save the world. We're kind of clicking on that at the moment, I'm not quite sure. Um, and I think we're sort of here today, I suppose, to talk about how climate change um, could be discussed and how people can be incentivized to take collective action um, around the climate crisis through gaming, how we can kind of bring people together. Um, and that's what we aim for this project. And so we're here with our project team um, to discuss that with you. So bear in mind that it's very much a work in progress. We don't have anything like finished to share with you. It's more kind of talking through the process of what we've been doing and some of the background and the research that's gone into this. Um, so yeah, I guess. Can I just ask a question initially? I was quite interested to know. I don't know if people could leave a note in the chat that are online. Um, but if you could like raise your hands if you found that playing a climate change themed game has incentivized you to take action in the real world. Has that is that something that's happened to you? Thank you. No, that's really helpful. It's just interesting. It's, that's what happens in more time. Just useful to know. Um, yeah, so just a bit of background on Megaverse. We're an interactive studio um, who specialise in live experiences um, with audience interaction, and we converge theatre, to film, gaming, and use immersive technologies to really connect with audiences in real time. Um, we're really excited about this project. It's a bit of a strange um, beast, but it's been really exciting to work on. Um, yeah. Maybe I should kick off and let you guys chat now. We're going to take. We're going to have three um, presentations. Uh, for you, and then we'll have a bit of a break and then come back and any questions and answers. So I was just going to ask these guys a couple of questions um, and then obviously open up to you guys if you have anything to ask as well. So initially, as I am just going to have a chat about um, the work that they've been doing around game studies, um, their incredible knowledge in this area. Um, so Zoranda, I'll give you a bit of like a bio, is that okay? Oh, I just always think it's nice. So Zoranda is a digital artist, research and games consultant. Um, they work with games developers to reflect on goals and risks when representing marginalised groups and um, surface unrecognised opportunities that exist in the commercial space of mainstream video game development. Um, led by ethnographic and historical research, Rayanda creates low fi glitchy games and custom hardware for festivals, galleries, and museums using interaction design to harness the expressive potential of audience participation. So Rayanda brings a lived experience to the Climate Playmakers project as a diversity and inclusion consultant. An expert in climate change related game gaming. We're really excited to have Zoran on the project. I will thank you. Thanks. I think I do need to go over there because I've mm. designed slides that need to be scrolled. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could sort of scroll if you want to do it. Yeah, all right. Let's, let's do that. Yeah. And then we can have one little <laughs> back chat about the user interface. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a there's always going to be a little yellow link at the bottom left that says next. If you click that, it'll go forward. Uh -huh. that is bad. Um, so I put just a few bullet points to give some semblance of like structure and chronology to how I got into this project. Um, it, my, my career actually doesn't make any sense and it's like very <laughs> peripatetic and portfolio based but whenever I have to pretend that it all is leading somewhere then the kind of timeline that I give funders and residencies um so I kind of started doing things with games in 2011 I was doing a master's course in history of design and material culture studies at the Royal College of Art um and then after a little gap started a part-time distance learning PhD at Lancaster. Um, when I first started that master's course, I was not planning on studying games, um, but there were these discussions we were having about global history and the kind of uh, cultural and economic systems that cause historical change. And uh, I really wanted more historians to be thinking um, about that in a systemic way. Um, I felt like the way that we think about that is kind of structured by the form of the essay as like this linear thing and you have to tell a linear story and I wanted to tell more linear stories. Um, I ended up uh, working as the senior curator at an uh, online 
games criticism on the topic, called Critical Distance, uh, for a couple of years, and I was still on the board of directors. Um, that was a really, really cool role to have. Um, and it gave me like a couple of years of really intense insight into the conversation about games that's happening online through enthusiast blogs, as well as like the crossover with middle state um, writing that kind of goes more into game studies, academia. Um, and it's that my experience during those couple of years still kind of informs my perspective quite a lot. Um, and yeah, it also gives me access to this amazing archive that we've built over several years of online critical writing about games. Um, in 2018, I uh, was part of the Freelance Artist Program, uh, which supported me to make interactive documentaries about trans people. Um, so that was based on social research, mainly through interviews. I've interviewed a really large number of trans people now and turned them into interactive characters. Um, and kind of my motivation there was to um, shift away from the empathy game framing of portrayals of marginalized identities and instead get players to kind of rehearse the interactions that they have with, in the world around them. Um, and uh, then since 2021, I've been moving more into interactive theater. Um, a big kickoff point for that was doing a collaboration with a games artist called Swinky, who I think some of you will come across. Um, uh, we worked together to make a, um, a new piece of interactive theatre inspired by something they did years prior uh, called Coffee and Misunderstanding. So Coffee and Misunderstanding was performed in real life uh, in all kinds of places, theatres, cafes, um, conferences, uh, where you'd have four members of the audience on stage at any given moment. Two of them were kind of puppets being uh, given lines to deliver through a handheld device like it looked like a mobile phone, but it was actually an iPod. And then two members of the audience behind them were their puppet masters and were choosing dialogue options of like what these two characters were gonna say to each other. And so we recreated a similar system to run online. And I've continued using that kind of system to do interactive theatre since then. And it's because of that work that I got connected with Megaverse, I think, as far as I'm aware. Next slide, please. <laughs> Um, oh, look at those big, chunky scroll bars. Um, so uh, when I started doing this work with Megaverse, kind of my starting points for thinking about our approach to portraying climate change through a, uh, well, we'll explain a bit later, is like an interactive VR theatre project uh, that audience has experienced through Twitch um, was, I think it's, I, I just felt like it's quite important to approach this in a way that isn't just about raising awareness. Um, because what we see when we uh, look at the impact that the climate crisis is having on young people, and the idea is that through using gaming, your like, acting in your <laughs> audience, um, is that it's causing a massive mental health crisis. Um, so just blasting people with more awareness of the nightmare that's facing us seems insensitive at best. Um, and I wanted to provide like a research support that could help take a, um, yeah, a more sensitive approach and look critically at the kind of conversations that we're having. Um, could you scroll to the right to number two? Thanks. So rather than thinking about how to portray climate change as a systemic process um, and make people understand it from that perspective, I wanted to think about what are the so-called meaningful choices, which is like one way of thinking about game design, right? Um, what are the meaningful choices that face climate activists? And so that led us to take more of a social research approach that's kind of, um, I can see a through line to what I've been doing before. Um, where we've done a lot of interviews with climate activists, we've done focus groups. Uh, we've also interviewed people who think about climate and think from the game side. Um, and uh, yeah, just trying to think about how do we tell stories that reflect the actual choices that we're all making day to day um, and the agency that we have and don't have um, when, we, when we're facing the climate crisis. Um, if you could scroll to item three. 
I don't know how long I've been talking for. Let's talk about it. Don't worry, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. Um, stop me or give me the time it's too long. Um, the, and then, um, yeah, another problem that we that you face when you're thinking about a project like this is that game design, like the established patterns of game design, I think, tend to be very inward focused. I think part of that is a commercial uh, prerogative to measure engagement in terms of how much attention is play is how much attention are players paying to this product that the game development studio have made. Um, and so I, I think over years of like iteration through primarily a commercial field of game development, um, you end up with game design patterns that are really good at keeping someone focused on one object and aren't as practiced at getting people to connect with the world around them. And there's no point doing a project like this if it's not going to build that kind of engagement with the world around you. Uh, click next. Um, so I thought I'd try and give not an overview of the game studies literature, but like some of the literature that was important to me in guiding this research project. Um, so I can't really see that. Um, maybe I can look at it over here. Bear with me. All right, I'm there. Um, so, uh, yeah. Part of it is thinking about um, the work Cameron Cunswellman has done in this. I don't need to talk about it too much because uh, Cameron's going to talk later today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, thinking about these assumptions about human agency um, in the in the kind of system of climate change and like the unevenness of that, the unevenness of who has agency and who is impacted by it. Um, and then also uh, Cameron's done a great job of um, like categorizing different ways that um, climate change is reflected in games, kind of with a bit of an emphasis on uh, management sins. Um, but yeah, kind of starting with thinking about games that model climate change and then shifting into thinking about games that even if they're still using modeling, they're approaching the problem in a way that's more affective. Um, a lot of my PhD research is about um, the way that affect is like figured and configured in game design. Um, so that kind of really stood out to me. Although Cameron's like conclusion is that like it's more productive to get past the affective model toward something that models direct intervention. Um, I kind of still feel quite seduced by the affective model, I think. Um, so I kind of kept looking at that. Um, do we need to scroll? Yes, we need to scroll. Um, I think that'll do. Uh, so uh, there's a great article by Megan Condis um, that uh, looks into how even games that are representing a climate apocalypse often portray it with like some other like magical or like figured cause other than like human um, industry. Um, or, or just like avoids naming the human causes of climate change. Um, so it, it, yeah, it suggests this tension around like addressing human agency. Um, if we scroll a little more, thanks. Um, the, uh, and that, that kind of connects to thinking about like rhetoric in games in this affective way. Um, there's an article that I really like. I don't know how to pronounce this person's name. Maybe someone in the room knows and can correct me. Um, but Parsi Valiaho. Um, kind of connects game design more generally, and this isn't specifically about climate games, but I think it's really relevant, um, connects game design to this sort of training of affect, which has been uh, something of interest in sociology for like decades. Um, the games are training you to respond to a scenario in a programmed set of ways. Um, of course, we've also got this on the side where player agency can work against that, but um, yeah, this kind of way that the body is addressed by game design. Um, I don't remember where I was going to go with this, but like, we'll just keep trying if you scroll right again. Um, I, uh, a, a big uh, area of interest for me is um, queer game studies, and particularly how queer game studies has looked at affect 
like queer affect studies is also like another subfield. Um, so there's this connection point of these things. Like once you start looking at affect in this queer way, you're looking at bodies and you're looking at material circumstances and um, how different ways of figuring emotion in games like directly connects to assumptions about who is playing, about what it means to feel the right way about a game, what it means to feel the right way about a particular scenario. Um, and something that's come out of that queer affect studies of games uh, is like counter affective readings and ways of playing. Um, if we scroll a bit more, um, I think that approach is reflected really well in, again, I really need to look up the pronunciation of people's names before I talk. Um, uh, Laura Opta Becker, again, someone yell at me if I'm wrong. Opta um, Beak, thank you. Awesome. Uh, Laura Opta Beak um, did a great uh, examination of the kind of climate game eco and the value of a counter affective way of reading and playing a game that is designed to make you feel kind of like to value kind of ways to be more in harmony with the environment. Um, the full expressive range of that game is like actually like is like benefits from playing it in a way that's malevolent and going actually I'm going to do as much damage to the environment as I can and like being this like antagonist to other players. Um, and then this connects to like different ways of imagining the way we might feel about the climate crisis. Um, like the idea of uh, solar nostalgia, like being nostalgic for um, a better relationship with the planet versus this like melancholy and like that connects to like a queer history of like reclaiming melancholy. Um, and if we just go uh, a little further, um, uh, I also don't, I wouldn't want to talk about this without mentioning Ben Abraham's amazing work on this, um, which uh, Reiji uh, did a great job of representing earlier. Um, but yeah, the big takeaway that I, I take from that is that like representing <laughs> change narratively is less important than connecting with the material um, as part of, uh, as a thing that's implicated in the game development process itself. Next, please. I'm going to stop talking soon because my mouth is dry. Yeah, I'm just going to go next. Um, so, yeah, just one last point. Um, when I think about further developments in uh, how we might approach this, um, I think one of the really interesting challenges with the project that we're working on is um, how do you reflect a global perspective, um, particularly in a global context where there's uneven agency and uneven impact, when you're working on a project that is really grounded in the local, in local impacts, thank you so much, um, and in local action, like how do you, how do we tell stories that reach the local and the global? I think it's going to be a really interesting thing to like look, look at, maybe look at the fun of a joint project or then explore and mm -hmm. see how like, you working on it. Um, I get to stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, please hold your questions in your brain because we'll do them all afterwards. Um, or write them down. Your brain's not like that. Like mine. Uh, so next up, we were going to hear from then Dr. Linda Dunlop, who is our other um, researcher and associate on our project team. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of Linda volume. Uh, so Linda is a senior lecturer in science education and a member of the University of York Science Education Group. Um, she works on science and environmental education and her research in um, science education has been supported by amongst others the Education Endowment Foundation, the Economic and Social Research Council, the Gatsby Foundation and the Open Trust. She recently co-led the 2021 British Education Research Association Commission on Education and Environmental Sustainability which has implications for policy and practice in primary, secondary, and higher education. Linda's teaching focuses on science and environmental education, um, and in 2018, she was the vice chancellor's award for teaching. Um, so we're really to her. I'll go to Linda and Linda to keep you for her. It's been totally invaluable um, in grounding what we're doing in sort of the real facts <laughs> of climate change um, and gaming. Over to Linda. 
Thanks, oh, Toki. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, okay, great. Um, yeah, and as Toki's introduction suggested, I'm kind of new to, to the games area. So um, one of the exciting things about this project is working across disciplines and sectors, but I feel a bit of an imposter here today. So I'm going to start off by talking about something that isn't a game, which is um, this um, film, Don't Look Up, you might have seen it a couple of years ago on Netflix at, around Christmas time, which is a story about scientists trying to draw attention to a comet that's going to um, head to Earth and kill everyone. And the reason I wanted to start with this is because I think um, it, it's, the film was used as a metaphor for science communication or for climate science communication. And some of the themes that the film explores are things that are very relevant when we're thinking about the, the place of games and particularly um, games with a narrative. So things like climate science being polarizing, we saw polarization in here, not a priority, people not always understanding science or trusting science and scientists. We saw people feeling worried, sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, all of those things. Um, yeah, we saw government inaction. Again, another thing that we see um, in, in climate change communication, and certainly Caroline Hickman in her research with thousands of young people across the world, um, has found that young people's anxieties around climate change are... Um, are associated with feeling betrayed about government inaction. And we also see um, kind of technological solutions being mooted and the kind of false hopes associated with some of those. So the, the question I wanted to focus on uh, in this was about how gaming can exchange audiences with climate change with a view to collective action. So I'm gonna um, focus on what the communication priorities are in relation to climate change and what we know about how to do that really well. And then I'll say a little bit about the research that Zoyander mentioned briefly that we've done with um, climate people involved in climate action, some of the key themes that came from that that are relevant to this. So this is just to show you um, how we've used research in this, um, in the development of this game. So we've brought together um, Zoyander's work on games research um, and my work on climate education and communication. And then we're also done some empirical work on climate social science, which has involved some scientists as well. So um, first of all, then climate communication research the what do we need to know about climate communication um, and Yale's program for climate change communication um, have, have done a lot of research on this and so there's five facts that everybody needs to know five facts ten words and um, this is this is the message that people need to communicate so the scientists agree it's real it's us it's bad but there's hope so I thought I might just take take each couple of um, words in this key message and say a few things about it or about how we know about it. So scientists agree. So um, a recent study in 2001 looking at peer reviewed um, publications found consensus like 99% of scientists agreeing that um, climate change is um, caused by humans. And um, it's really important, I think, to to um, highlight that because a lot of the kind of climate denial or climate skepticism has um, has been a result of like the triumph of doubt. So people raising doubt about the causes of climate change. So telling people about the consensus um, is a kind of pre-bunking strategy so that they, they're not thinking that there's this doubt among scientists when that's not really the consensus view. Um, it's real. So you might be familiar with um, this image. It's Ed Hawkins climate strikes stripes and um, they show the average global temperature compared with the average um, and how they've risen over the last um, two centuries. So blue years are colder than average and um, the red ones are hotter than average. And you can see as we get towards the right hand side, just the degree of, of heating that's going on. Um, it's us. So um, climate change is caused by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases trapping heat in the atmosphere, which acts like a kind of blanket. 
Um, and this diagram from our world in data at the University of Oxford shows global green greenhouse gas emissions by sector. So we can see the energy use in industry, transport, buildings, so all human core um, sources of greenhouse gas emissions associated with producing energy um, are the highest um, contributors. And then we've got agriculture for food, food use, change of land use, so things like deforestation as well as industry. Um, going a bit towards um, the bleak now, so it's it's bad. Um, this quote um, was by um, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez talking about the flooding in Pakistan last year. So describing it as a level of climate carnage beyond imagination, lives being literally wa washed away. Um, closer to home, we've um, attribution studies have found that the heavy rainfall, which caused flooding across Europe, was associated was more likely because of climate change. And those are just the, the consequences in the present. So sometimes there's um, a focus on talking about climate change impacts as in the future, but they're very much in the here and now, and we're seeing the, the effects already. Um, but there's hope. Um, we know what the problem is. So in some ways, it's quite simple. Stop burning fossil fuels. Um, and there's lots of ways to stop using fossil fuels from changing the way we live, eat, consume, travel, invest, protecting and restoring um, green areas, um, blue carbon, so carbon stored in ocean, ocean. So there's lots of things that can be done. Um, so that should give us some hope and there's time we we can still take action but we need to have um we need to have hope with a plan of action it can't just be blind hope that someone else is going to um going to do that make the change that is needed so that's what we need to communicate that's the message but um how do we do that um, and this is where um, research from the Monitoring and Evaluating Climate Communication Project comes in. They talk about um, quality climate communication not only being about cognitive engagement. So I think a lot of work is focused on talking about climate change or explaining climate change, but that's that's one part of it. We also need socio-emotional, so feeling and connecting with others, as well as action orientation, so making sure that we're developing skills of people to change their behaviours and practices and link the individual and collective side of things to reduce our climate impacts. There were just a few things relevant to um, climate change um, game research that I wanted to draw attention to. The first was that um, a lot of games um, have been designed for learning purposes, so they might tend to um, reach people who are already convinced, not really take account of the knowledge action gaps, and might also be limited to education settings. So, um, yeah, so to people who are a captive audience. Um, but even though that's where a lot of work has focused, um, where players of games have reported increased desire to learn and act on climate change, it tends to be associated with changed feelings rather than knowing more. So that um, importance of narrative, of agency um, and changing people's or thinking about the ways people feel is also really important. And then um, there's been a, a trend towards mechanisms that take people out of the game. So there's somewhere um, you can be asked to um, take take action beyond the game in your house or in your community. Um, so just rounding off really, um, so that's some of the research that we've drawn on in, in developing this game. Another set of um, research that we've drawn on is um, the focus groups and interviews with um, people involved in climate action um, that Zoyander mentioned earlier. So I just wanted to draw attention to a few of those kind of key themes that that people talked about. Um, so a really important motivation was that now is the time our actions can have the greatest impact. So if you're going to act, now is the best time to act. Um, there was um, a sense amongst the activists that we spoke to that you didn't have to wear a badge, protest. Um, there was a, a lot of quiet activism. So people just changing what they could, where they had influence. Um, but it was, uh, it, it, it's, 
a difficult thing, I guess, to be a climate activist. So many of the people that we spoke to talked about feeling alienated from friends and families and from mainstream economic values that made climate action um, kind of unusual or a difficult thing to be to be doing where um, lots of everyday choices were kind of called into question. Um, but the alienation wasn't just between friends and family um, and people outside activism. There were also tensions within in terms of what strategy um, should be used to um, take climate action and a kind of sense of you have to be like the very highest, come to the very, very highest standards of um, activism and environmental practice in your own life. So um, lots of tensions kind of within. Um, and one of the things that we asked people to do was to imagine their activism was a drink and what, what sort of drink would it be? Um, and kind of a theme that came from that was water of life, because there was a sense of it being everywhere, transparent, serious, consistent, but also some people described it as like a strong alcoholic shot that makes you feel alive, that's intense, that needs a long time in brewing. Um, so, yeah, um, that's some of the kind of emerging findings that came out of our focus groups that have been um, used to inform the story. Um, and I started off with that um, message that scientists agree it's real, it's us, it's bad, and there's hope. Um, and that's what we hope to do, I think, through this game is to, to generate some hope, um, focusing on collective action and climate justice. So I thought I'd leave with um, this lovely um, quote from Vanessa Nakate, who's a youth climate activist. And um, yeah, hand back to Toki, if that's okay. Thanks, Linda. Um, right, that was really good. Uh, right, so we've got our third um, talk now. Um, so Ben, uh, Ben pre-recorded this because he's in Paris. We weren't entirely sure whether the connection was going to be okay. So he is here with us um, on Zoom, but we're just going to play the recorded talk. Um, so Ben is a co-founder of Megaverse, um, an award-winning interactive studio, as we have previously mentioned. Um, so Ben and our team specialise in building virtual and tactile worlds that prioritise user experience across multiple platforms. As a graduate of Kingston University with a first-class degree in drama, Ben is passionate about democratising technology and empowering young people to creatively um, leverage it to tell their own stories. With a natural ability to work in harmony with creatives to bring our artistic visions to fruition and to find skills and forward thinking figure in the realm of interactive design. Um, it obviously mm -hmm. it's like to check out Megaverse and find out what we've done, the projects we've done, we've done a big range of different things. Um Megaverse.co. But for now, let's hear from Ben. Hello everyone, my name is Ben. I'm the director at Megaverse, an interactive studio based in Sheffield. I'm thrilled to be a part of multi-platform three, remake, reuse, replay to discuss a topic that I'm very passionate about, the intersection of gaming and climate change. Today, I want to share with you our latest project, which is called Climate Playmakers, which was commissioned by UKRI. This project aims to engage minority groups with climate messaging through reading and gaming. Our piece is a unique blend of theater, film, and gaming, eroding the boundaries between these forms to create an immersive an interactive storytelling experience. At the heart of Climate Playmakers is interactive storytelling. We believe that by giving our audience autonomy with decision making, we can build empathy and create a sense of ownership where their actions have direct consequences through a visually re reactive story. This is achieved through real time cause and effect scenarios facilitated by polls and also a chat feature. We're not just telling the story, we're creating an external world that will feel familiar to our audience, that is responsive to their actions. One of the key principles of our project is learning through play. By making the experience fun and lighthearted, we will allow people to let their guard down and let go of preconceptions and engage with the material in a way that doesn't feel like a chore. We don't want to lecture it's but rather let them explore the complex web of climate research and messaging through balancing narrative and gameplay. Keeping our story inside a game center 
we have complete control and flexibility to tailor the world we care to the specific needs of the story uh, and target our audience. In climate playmakers, we create a city based on northern towns and cities in the UK where we can simulate flooding and other extreme weather events that would stop being possible through traditional means. This approach also allows us to show rather than tell how climate messaging will impact places that are familiar to us. The games engine also allows us to design more authentic interaction for our audience, where we can dictate more elements of form to suit the content. Rather than trying to shoot more interaction into a traditional form that's already established, I can sometimes feel a little bit cumbersome and has the danger of a gimmick. The key aspect of using the games engine to tell a story about climate change is giving the audience a role within the story. By making them part of the story, they become an active participant in the work rather than just a passive spectator. And we feel this increases the sense of ownership and shared responsibility. We've incorporated uh, a chat feature and polls into climate play makers. The chat feature allows audiences to freely communicate both with one another and also the characters in the story world. And this direct interaction fosters a sense of community and gives meaning to their words within the story when telling. Our early R and D with the National Youth Theatre helped us refine these features. We created Eco, an AI robot, to serve as a conduit between the audience and the actors. Eco is part of the story world and is an AI robot taking influence from voice assistants like Siri and Alexa, um, and also the latest developments in AI like ChatGPT. Eco also acts as a metaphor to highlight how technological innovation will also play a key role in combating climate change. The integration of live theatre within the games engine is still fairly normal and something we're very passionate about at Megaverse. We can't wait to see the audience's reactions to the avatars that respond in real time to their, to their comments and input. Uh, to ensure a seamless, immersive experience, we've harnessed Amazon's interactive video services. This technology offers exceptionally low latency, keeping the audience a mere three seconds behind the live action. Our commitment to minimizing this delay is rooted in our desire to create a powerful, immediate connection between the audience their input and responsive world we've crafted. We believe that the true magic of theatre lies in its immediacy, in its unpredictability and its capability to exist only in the moment. Theatre is a living, breathing entity, a symbiotic relationship between actors and audience that is unlike any other form of storytelling. It's a shared journey, a collective experience that sparks through an electric energy. This unique bond, this transaction of emotions and experiences is the heart of theatre. By bringing this dynamic into the gaming world, we aim to tap into the power of this relationship, creating a truly unique, interactive experience. So I'm just going to show you now a short clip, which should give you a bit of an insight into our R&D process when we were working with the National Youth Theatre, um, looking to develop how we create this audience interaction between the between the audience and the live performers. Although the style of acting will be much closer to the interacting, but there isn't any particular frame or there's no cuts. It, I guess it's sort of like a live broadcast in that sense. Well, we can still cut and create a cinematic film like experience, but yeah, it's still running in live time and the actors don't get to just cut and stop. They've got to carry it going. 
the affordances of the game safety also allow us um, ultimate flexibility on camera angles, creating impossible shots that traditional media wouldn't be able to achieve. This project represents the convergence of different forms coming together to get a new type of story driven experience that aims to educate and inspire. We hope that through climate playmakers, our audience will feel like part of the collective making change, part of the team working towards a sustainable future. As we delve deeper into the potential of game and the climate messaging, we encourage you all to join us on this journey. Interactive storytelling is a powerful tool capable of engaging audiences, fostering empathy, and inspiring collective action for a sustainable future. Game centers are no longer the exclusive domain for seasoned uh, developers. They're becoming more accessible, offering fresh approaches to storytelling and challenging traditional conventions. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really great to share some insights from our latest project with you. So yeah, we've got like 15 to 10 minutes um, for questions and things. So I had a couple, but I also don't want to dominate because we haven't got that much time. So should I kick off or is there any press, are there any pressing questions that people would like to get, get in? Or any through Zoom? Or through Zoom? Oh, yeah, people might be asking. Me Sorry, um, I was just going to say, uh, Toki, that the booth I think has got quite busy. Uh, so if there's any direct questions to me, um, I'll have to take them now, otherwise I'm going to have to go and give Helen a, a helping hand. Nothing in the chat, okay, cool. Ben, I think you're released if you want to go. Okay, really, really um, great to see everyone there. Um, hope it's going well, yes. and uh, yeah, catch up soon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions for Leanne or Linda? Or should I just ask a question? Oh, there's one at there from Terry. I have a question about the, um, hopefully people can hear me on the owl. I have a question about the interaction between the digital elements of your uh, performances and your creations and the analog and kind of uh, haptic elements and the kind of like in the room interactions and stuff how, mm. how how do the digital and the game engine stuff work with the sort of haptic physical analog side of immersive performance yeah thing? so that probably was a better question but that's <laughs> probably, i'll try and answer it um even though i'm not very techy uh but basically the the way the game is going to be set up at the moment is there isn't a there isn't a direct like haptic re like response i suppose in the way that i think about it um between the character like the actors and the and the you know audience um so the setup for the game at the moment is that the audience will be remote and they'll watch and participate through twitch or something like twitch we might use amazon ibs um so they'll use the chat they'll use the poll features so they'll direct the branching narratives they'll choose those directions but collectively um and that might be through campaigning um, through the chat. They might have certain um, arguments that are quite compelling. Um, and the way that we're then filtering that chat and turning so it's not just like a far out, like a you know a tsunami of loads of different opinions. Is we have our AI robot Eco. Um, we will collate all of that and is our kind of AI. So but essentially informed by the audience. And so they are our fourth cast member, um, and they will interact with the other three cast. Um, within the show to make that happen. Is it kind of like TYOA, do your own adventure style? Kind of, except it's everybody, it's choose our yeah, adventure, right. if that makes sense. Right. Um, so it's different because it's about that collective action. So, you know, our audience have to operate in a way where they actually come to a bit of a consensus together in some way, yeah, exactly. or eco our, you know, Character has to bring consensus out of those elements. In the chat, Linda mentioned people using the work of Ben Bowman and Aria and Sarah Kitchen. I just thought that I was find that action. But Ben Bowman, who's here at the Manchester Centre for Youth Studies, is working with Sharon McCowan over at Salford, and they do, I've just helped them run a climate person with young people. It's exactly the same kinds of like idea, but no digital element, no AI element. It was just like trying to reach a consensus around. Like a, a scenario, mm -hmm. and then like working yeah. together to exactly, yeah, like work through. So I think those kind of things are just brilliant for 
like you say, moving away from just simple education. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Information delivery or yeah. And if I'm honest with you, our you know, the aim that we've been set by our funder is we want people to engage with climate related research, you know, which mm. is much more about like mm. let's share some handy facts and make sure people are aware of things. Mm. But that's not what we're about. And ultimately they've picked our tender for for a reason. And that's because the project team are about action and about trying to create, you know, a sense of hope and change and wanting to do something. Um, so that's our focus. And obviously as part of that, we hope we will also impart information to people who maybe aren't really participating at the moment but really it's about how do you how do we make that step feel not so scary to actually do something um really that's kind of where we're coming from i don't know yeah linda i don't know if you had any comment on that as well yeah i agree i think telling just or focusing just on the science is kind of uh, feels up a little bit dishonest because you can't consider the the science be uh, you know, separated from the social, political, economic impacts and all of the consequences that we talked about. So I think it is really important that it's that is integrated into into the story. And I think that's what's really exciting about this is that it's not just talking about the science. It's it's a chance to imagine a different future, imagine some of those consequences and yeah, act together on them. Yeah. I think we've, I mean, we've been having lots of fun, like trying to write the script at the moment. Well, you know, Emma's writing the script, but been trying to uh, feed lots of research and potential that might happen in 2030 into that as well. It's been really interesting. I don't know who was first. Do you know? I'll, I'll, oh, you're I'll, so I'll polite. So. You go first. <laughs> so, how are decisions made by this collective audience? Are you formalizing that or is it just giving them to? uh well so we will have polls so that will be multiple choice which is not as exciting because you know ultimately it's like pick one of these four options um but we're also going to be collating everything in the chat and so that kind of comes down to probably me as the moderator um playing bond a little bit with it and looking at kind of what comes through obviously you know filtering out the trolls and then finding like what is the common consensus here um, and looking through, you know, the comments that people are leaving, what are the themes that are being, being represented, and also just the stuff that's really exciting and interesting, and you know, um, but we're also going to have kind of, ideally, this is our plan anyway, to have sort of like um, emojis and kind of voting options as well, so I guess, you know, where people might be saying something that's popular and people more supported, um, so you can kind of build that picture. Are you looking for consensus or a majority? Well, Majority ultimately, because I don't think we can get consensus in the time frame we've got from Blink. Yeah. Um, because we have to keep the narrative <laughs> going as well. So it's this real like tussle between what we script and how we keep the, the narrative flowing through the environments we've built. Like we can't suddenly build an unreal environment because somebody said, Oh, that you should go to this like you know shop <laughs> and go do something. Um, so it has to be within the realm. So there is restriction within the game world, um, but then also. We really want that, you know, half of it is going to be improvised, there's going to be audience responses and the cast reacting to those those comments and those like nudges and provocations. So yeah, we're asking a lot of our talent, basically. I think there's something like very narratively compelling about uh, majority versus consensus, like maybe particularly as a studio that's based in the UK, like just narratively playing out the reality that like, well, now we're all dealing with consequences of something that 52% of people Yeah, right. <laughs> and that feels like a consensus more. It would be lovely to try to build consensus. And I think the other element of what we're doing is looking at um, everything that happens across these six episodes, pulling in all of that data so that we can produce something at the end that's like, these, these are the results of like, this is what our audience have said, you know? These are the things they really care about. This is these are the actions that they want to happen. These are the things they're doing. So I think that will be quite an interesting output. But again, like yeah, views will be different. I'll be going in different directions. So hello. Um, fascinating. Just pick up on, on that question mm. and your answer. We, we relatively recently ran a live play of a 1980s romance game book, which was a sort of written for single players, but actually we played it collaboratively with lots of people over over Zoom. And getting people to explain why they chose what they chose or what the implications were was really compelling and interesting. Uh, I think yeah. that, yeah. 
would be really interesting to do that. Yeah. But I guess it was fascinating. We didn't have, we also didn't have consensus where people are doing lobbying for, you know, the, 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 the romance school. So yeah. you know, this, this dark hair stranger or do you buy your horses or something? <laughs> but, it, but it was really interesting seeing how fantasy decision making or non collaborative played out and yeah. the implications was fascinating. My question was, was I think it's probably quite a basic one, but what's the story of the game? What, 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 what are people actually doing? In, in the, in the, in the, the... That's a really good question. We haven't actually explained that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Forget when you're doing something that you can't really know what it is. Um, essentially, they are the Climate Justice League working title, because you probably can't keep that for various copyright reasons. Um, and they're three uh, humanoid characters um, and eco they are robot. And essentially, their task is to um, make change in. Sorry. Um, yeah, their task is to sort of make change in their local community. Um, they've had a flood recently, and so they then go out and, you know, try and support the community, or they're trying to potentially take down the corporation. So there's quite a few different options, in a sense, of like where the story will go or what will happen. Um, but they're, I guess, the, name, the way that we're playing out the story is that we want it to have nuance. We want it to have a little bit of that kind of you know, yes, the corporation's bad, but what does greenwashing look like? And what, you know, when are they actually trying to do good things? And are they ever, or is this all just a play? Um, and we also have like interactions with our local MP. So it's kind of like they're talking the talk. Do they want to make good policy change? But are they really serious about it? Or, you know, they just, so with, I guess it's got a little bit of that sort of slight mystery vibe about it, about whether people are, who they say they are and what are, what are the real intentions? And so each episode kind of deals with a different challenge. And within each of those episodes, there's sort of a major decision that has to be made by the audience around, you know, do you, are you complicit or are you against? Or if you're going to demonstrate, for instance, how do you demonstrate or who do you target? Do you target industry? Do you target policy? Do you target the individuals that need to take action? So we're trying to pick out the things that have come out from our focus groups and working with climate activists and working with underrepresented communities that we've been um, engaging with as well to we see what are the kind of real key like topics and tough decisions that have to be made and bring that into the game but in a fun way <laughs> so yeah, you can see there's quite a lot going on like um, that, that <laughs> winery as well like there's like one of the major like plot arcs that is a currently planned for the series it's around like um conflict between like within the group and like that reflects what was coming out of that research that we did with climate activists but like um that's one of the biggest stress loads is like maintaining those relationships internally it's interesting i'm like the more i think about it the more i feel like a lot of people like you know it's just it's just like powerless aren't you to what people are going to put in the chat but just thinking what are we going to have to make these factors do <laughs> <laughs> is there any other yeah yeah sure uh, so how are you you casting the actors and how are you casting the the audience. Well, we're not. It's a free for all. Anyone can anyone can play. It's free. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. Right. Social experiment. We we yeah. So we are targeting the we are targeting underrepresented communities. Is obviously a massive catch-all term. Um, but the the focus for us is around who are the people who are first hit by. Climate related, um, the climate conflict crisis, obviously. So, people in sort of, yeah, high blood risk areas, people who might be, yeah, more affected from the socioeconomic basis as well, um, around, so yeah, the impacts of climate change. So, there's a few sort of key target groups that we're looking at that we want to engage in this. Um, and also, I suppose, they're the people who have informed our decision making around the story and, the, and, and around how this is built. Um, so yeah, it's a it, that's kind of our focus, but ultimately, yeah, it's open to anyone that we want we, we want a mixed quite yeah, broad set of demographics, intergenerational kind of game experience for people really. Um I think that makes it all much more interesting as well. I think I have a question around whether the um audience themselves have a role within the fiction or whether they're just sort of spectators watching today, sharing their perspectives on a story set in the future, and whether that relates to any of the research you talked about, about sort of empathy and agency and where you position the player or the audience relative to the characters. 
Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. I think I, in a way, I would love us to have them more involved in a sense. Um, we've had we've had people involved in the creation of like you know I wouldn't call it co-created. I wouldn't go that far. I think it has been sort of the vision and the project that's brought the science, the science in, it's brought our writer and the creative um, associates in. But I guess <laughs> within the actual delivery of the game, ultimately we have been had to be quite strict with the world that we can provide and with the narrative. With the chat, we've not invited them to write as if they were part of this same story, but they're they're writing. Yeah, themselves. they're writing as themselves, but we refer to everybody as part of the collective. So they are, yeah, they're part of the their data, their data points for Eco the robot, mm -hmm. right? So they're kind of um, in the same way that we are data points for AI. They are this, they are those. So it's kind of yeah, they're that collective voice that's being brought forward. So when Eco is in the game speaking, they'll be like, oh, so and so says this, and oh, you know, my, you know, the collective is saying this. So it's kind of yeah, <laughs> murky. <laughs> Um, sorry, I feel like I'm answering all the questions. I'm supposed to be giving them to you. Yeah. Um, can I ask you guys some questions if nobody else has any to ask? Um, I was going to ask you, sorry, Amanda, um, about, I guess, like, if you're, have you, do you, are you aware of gaming having created like a revolution or a big revolution? Or what's your understanding of gaming's power to create a revolution i guess yeah like i feel it's a big question but i think my answer to it is super annoying um because like uh like i'm a you know i was a historian for a while and i'm a sociologist and like i'm always looking for like the friction and the the thing that doesn't quite work the way that you expect it to um so like when i think about that kind of thing i think about stuff like um uh, the origin of rock, paper, scissors being, I bet this turns out to be wrong, but <laughs> no. the origin of rock, paper, scissors being in like a uh, creepy name from Edo theory of Japan, um, where uh, instead of it just being like your hands, your different angles. Um, but the, you know, the idea of it is that you have this hierarchy and like a stratified society, which was the contemporary reality, and then a person who seems to be on the top is actually vulnerable to the person who's at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so it like represents something that is challenging to the dominant power structure. Um, but like there wasn't a revolution. <laughs> like <laughs> like it, it changed when like uh, international geopolitics changed. Like it that it didn't, it, despite it being modeled in this game that people were playing quite a lot, like it, it didn't lead to social change. Um so I don't know, like I, there's things like that where I'm like, there's our relationship to games is like, it's not mimetic. Like there's, it's there's something which could put him about it. Like, um, it's the same thing with like the origin of Monopoly being the landlord's game, and like the point of it was to show that like our entire system of property ownership is messed up. Um, but like that again, like that system didn't change. Um, so. Like, I don't think maybe it's just taught us to try and find what it tells. <laughs> yeah, tricky. Interesting, no, thank you. <laughs> um, I think we're nearly there, but can, um, can I just ask Linda one question? Just because of fairness and honesty, that's okay. Um, Linda, I think what I wanted to ask you um, was what examples are there in terms of like inciting hope? through storytelling around climate change? And like, who, are there any leaders of this? So um, I think in, in the kind of um, world of fiction, um, there's one of my favorite stories is um, Unlondon by China Mieville. It's a young adult novel that um, looks at the, the agency of a, a young person in kind of a, a parallel for London. Um, and I think that's a really interesting story because it it, it has hope, but um, it's that kind of in or cautious hope. It's that 
um, hope that comes about because you're working with others on something. So I think there's some nice examples from fiction. I I mean, I really like Don't Look Up as kind of a, well, no, it's not hopeful, no. Um, as climate communication, I like it, but perhaps less, less in terms of hope. Um, and again, I think I'm going to bleak place. There's um, there's a collective in um, coming out of UBC, so they're called Decolonial Futures, and they um, they write and have designed some um, experiments on thinking about more kind of hospicing the planet, but looking at um, at environment and storytelling and critical questioning and reflection so I think they're doing some really interesting work there on yeah on decolonial futures um maybe one I will answer your question now one hopeful example is um so there's a, a blog by um so Britt Ray um called Gen Dread and it deals with kind of the emotions around um climate change and um and kind of gathers kind of resources, networks, projects that people can get involved with. So um, I think that's probably a, a great hopeful point um, to answer your question, Toki. Now I know it's, and it's sort of, you know, I think we were just saying, and then sort of breaks out to make some tricky one, isn't it? Because it's really simplified sometimes to talk about, about hope and actually just jollying things along isn't really the way of it we all have to kind of take consolation in the reality of the situation and then they address the bleakness as well and not deny it because that's not useful to anybody but it feels like there's a yeah holding all of those all of those things and still maintaining enough hope to create action is kind of where we're trying to sit with this project I suppose um thanks everybody for listening for listening to us really appreciate that um yeah Thank you.